Welcome back to another episode. Today I'm going to be sharing some of the creepiest and allegedly true mountain horror stories that I've shared over the past couple of months. From the Smoky Mountains to the Cascades, there are some truly scary stories out there. But I also have one quick thing to tell you guys before we jump into these stories. I have a major announcement to make. I have recently partnered with several other narrators to help build out Chilling, a brand new home for scary stories. Chilling is a revolutionary mobile app that allows you to customize your listening experience in ways that YouTube never can. Before you go download and start your free trial, let me share with you a little bit about what Chilling has to offer. We have hundreds of amazing stories, terrifyingly true stories, and different categories of horrifying fiction. There is something for every single horror fan out there. And even though Chilling has plenty of pre-generated playlists, you also have the ability to make your own playlist and mix and match individual stories and create your own customized experience. Try doing that on YouTube. One of the most exciting things about Chilling is our one-of-a-kind ambient sound menu. You can select and change the background noise of any scary story without it even affecting the story you're listening to. So you can start off a story by sitting by a crackling campfire and end it off in a nice thunderstorm. Let's talk about the best part of Chilling. It's completely ad-free. That's right, no ads. You can listen to hours and hours and hours of stories with zero interruptions. And as much as you might love listening to my YouTube channel, I want to give you more options. The stories you're going to find on Chilling will never be found on this YouTube channel. And this is just the beginning. We will be adding content multiple times a week and expanding the variety of content to include classic novels and audio series. Beyond narration, we are already hard at work to add the ability to stream video content in the form of chilling original movies and shows. These first few months are so important for us to fine tune the platform to become something special and I hope you will follow us on the journey. So what are you waiting for? Download now and start your free trial today. Go to your app store and just search chilling or simply click the link in the description down below. Anybody who has ever camped up in the Adirondack area of upstate New York knows just how breathtaking and beautiful it can be any time of year. Last year, I stayed up with my family in a cabin that rested up in the mountains. I had recently split up with my longtime girlfriend and it seemed like a wonderful place to go clear my head. At first, my theory was correct. It was therapeutic and beautiful being out in nature and was nice spending some time with my family. One of the really nice things about this cabin was that it was truly separated from any other resident. The closest cabin or campsite was probably at least a mile or more away. This meant we had total and complete privacy. Or so we thought. One late afternoon, probably around 5 p.m., we heard some shuffling coming from the front of the cabin. We were sitting on the back porch and heard some movement that sounded like footsteps. A little on edge, my brother and I got up and got ready, just in case we needed to leap into action. Suddenly, two middle-aged men walked into the back where we were sitting. I asked in a very abrasive and annoying voice, Hey, what are you doing? Can I help you with something? The men just looked and laughed and said in a cheery voice, Why, hello there, young man. My name is Lewis, and this is Tito. We just really wanted to check the view at this place. We have heard so many wonderful stories. The man seemed nice. But something just did not seem right to me. I still looked at them with an uneasy feeling in my stomach. But my mother, who is a very friendly person, made small talk with the man. Perhaps the most unsettling thing of this entire interaction was the friend named Tito, who was just standing and looking around at the house, with seemingly no facial movements or anything. Lewis was charismatic, smiled a lot, and made lots of eye contact, where Tito was almost the opposite. After several minutes of just random small talk, they vanished back into the woods. I was not a fan of this at all, and quickly let my family know about it. Where were these guys coming from anyways, I thought. As I stated previously, the closest place was probably more than a mile or so away, and that place belonged to the guy who owned the cabin we were staying in. So, Louis and Tito must have been hiking for a little while to get to our cabin, 
which is not unlikely up in the Adirondacks, but something was off about the entire interaction. It bothered me all night. Around 11 p.m., my family went to bed, and I sat around a fire with my brother and his fiance. Every little noise I heard caused me to jump. My brother told me not to worry about it, and I was just worrying too much and to get over it. I pretended everything was okay, but really, I was still uneasy about our unwelcomed visitors. Shortly after midnight, it was just my brother and me around the fire. We decided to let the last few logs burn before we went inside. This is when Lewis decided to pay us another visit, but this time he was not so friendly. My brother and I jumped out of our chairs. We were now facing Lewis and Tito, who were coming out of the woods. They looked absolutely crazy. Lewis did not have that same charming personality as before. His eyes were bulging from his head, and he flashed his pearly white teeth in an almost sadistic type of way. Tito, who was almost a statue earlier in the day, stood next to Lewis, also smiling and slowly approaching me and my brother. Lewis started to slowly approach us and said, This cabin really is lovely. I think we'll be staying here now. He reached into his bag to pull something out. Tito, who was slightly behind him, was already wielding some sort of bushwhacking sword. Not trying to take any chances as to what Lewis was pulling out of the bag, my brother decided to tackle the man. He went down with relative ease. As Tito approached my brother with the sword, I ran over and pushed him, strictly only using adrenaline as my motivator. Both men got up and backed away slowly. Lewis now standing about 10 feet away, he kept saying, You have no idea who I am and who you are messing with. I built this house. This is my land. After repeating this a couple of times, Tito finally spoke up as well and said in an almost robotic voice, We shall have our land back. We must wait for the right time. Tito grabbed the shoulder of Lewis, and they both ran into the woods. Remember, this is midnight in the woods, so it was pitch black other than a soft orange light coming from our fire. We put the fire out rather quickly and went inside the cabin and made sure all the doors and windows were locked firmly. My brother and I stayed up all night basically watching the property and making sure they did not return. I have never been so happy to see the sun in my entire life. The next day we went to see the property owner and told him about it. He said he had never heard those two names before and assured me that no Lewis ever built the house. The owner who we are renting the cabin from told us that he built the cabin 10 years ago. So who were these two men that claimed they built the cabin? The owner was kind enough to refund us the rest of our nights and we got out of there. It definitely isn't the worst encounter by any means, but it was absolutely terrifying to go through. You never know who's going to be creeping around outside, so be sure to always stay safe and lock your doors. This one started out as a regular night. Three of my friends and I went out into this Adirondack mountain shelter that we called the Addy. It was maybe about 500 feet into the wood lot at the edge of our dorm parking lot. It is basically a small lean-to shelter built out of logs with a metal roof and an open front. It is a spot we had been going to almost every single night for several years to smoke weed before bed, and sometimes even during the daytime. Occasionally, we would see some strange things that we could not quite explain, like random lights off in the distance of varying colors disappearing and reappearing in no consistent pattern. The woods were several acres deep in that direction, and it was a rural area with family-owned agricultural fields at some point past the forest. You could walk for probably 30 minutes in that direction and still not be out of the woods. This night, we saw the same lights, and they often are accompanied by an uneasy feeling, like there's static in the air. Granted, I know every time we saw these things we were smoking, but I don't really get all that paranoid when I smoke, but I digress. It was a trend, and I was not the only one noticing them. Anyway, this one night, all of us were feeling uneasy and hyper aware of our surroundings, trying to finish up our bowl and go back to the dorm. Then, suddenly out of nowhere, there was a huge crash on top of the metal roof of our Addy. 
All four of us happened to be sitting in a small circle inside the corner of the shelter of the floor. We all were getting terrified and grabbed each other, ducking as close as we could to the floor, expecting the shelter's roof to collapse in on us. It felt like a huge tree fell on top of the shelter. A moment later, when the shelter had held strong, we all shakily looked around. We all quickly decided to get up and get back to the dorm as quickly as we could. It was night, so we could not see very well. So, we were leaving, but all our hearts were racing, and we were too shaken up to stay and investigate. The next day, we went out during the daytime to see if we could investigate and see what happened. We looked to see if there was a tree that fell, and there were no downed trees around the Addy, and no fallen branches large enough to make the sound that we heard. That was something terrifying to discover. I tried doing some research to see if anything weird happened out in those woods or in that area of the Adirondack Mountains. Previously, as I have stated, I have had several unexplainable experiences there throughout the years. I found out that there is an old fort about 15 to 20 miles away from where we are, and there's a big ambush involving Native Americans way back during the French and Indian War, where many Native Americans and French died. I always wondered if any of the paranormal experiences in those woods were related to the Native American spirits that previously called those woods their home. I'll never know for sure, but it is an interesting thing to think about, and something I'll never forget. This happened to me and a close friend. We are both 23-year-old males. This happened just last month. We decided to go on a two-night backpacking and camping trip in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. We are both extremely comfortable with nature and spend a lot of time camping, hunting, fishing, etc. We hiked about five miles into a small lake and set up camp on a small beach. This was not a heavily trafficked area and we did not expect to see or to run into anybody else. Our first night there was just us sitting around the fire. We saw a flashlight moving on the other side of the lake at around 10.30. This was unusual. However, we did not think too terribly much of it at the time. But as time went on, this flashlight kept moving around the lake getting closer to our campsite. We kept discussing who could possibly be wandering around the woods in the middle of the night, and we did not particularly want an unwelcomed guest. Once it was clear that the person or people was heading for our campsite, we moved off into the woods nearby to see who wandered up. I took a small axe with me, and my friend had a 22 rifle. Now, we were not expecting trouble, and we certainly did not want to make any, but we figured we might as well cover our basis. Now, the moment of truth. The flashlight comes near the light of our fire, and it is just one lone man. He has a beard, and is probably in his mid-40s or so. The scary part was what he was carrying. It turned out to be a pump action shotgun. He walked around the campsite a few times and then proceeded to enter our tent. After rummaging around for a minute or so, he came out and started yelling. I know you're out there. Why don't you come and say hello? My friend and I remained motionless under a hemlock tree about 50 yards away. That is when the man proceeded to fire his shotgun into the woods, not too far from where we were sitting. He also swung his flashlight around several times. After what felt like hours, he grabbed my friend's backpack and a few articles of clothing we had drying off near the fire and threw them in to burn. My friend, who had his 22 trained on the man the entire time, asked me if I should shoot. I told him not unless he spots us and starts to point the gun in our direction. Thankfully, the man moved off from where he had come after a little while. We waited until his flashlight was on the other side of the lake ran out, grabbed everything we could fit in my backpack, and took off. It was now around 2 or 3 a.m. at this point. We ran out the trail with flashlights and made it back to our car as the sun was coming up. We immediately went to the police department and reported it, where we also spoke to some forest rangers. That was it, really. I have not heard anything back from the police. It was not mysterious. However, it creeped the absolute hell out of us. At the time, I was a 20-year-old female, and I just moved down to a small town all alone in upstate New York. 
I had grown up in another, slightly larger town about 60 miles north, and just wanted a new start. I love camping. I often go camping in the Adirondacks, but at the time I had not made any real friends, so I was not going to go into the real deep woods alone. Down the road from me, I had been walking around and found an area where the power lines cut through a wooded section. The power lines are perpendicular to the road. It was near a house, but far enough to the right of the house where I thought people would not mind if I walked up the trail that the power lines make. I'm not sure about other countries, but in the United States they keep the power lines clear in case maintenance is necessary. So I wander up there. I noticed how the woods were pretty deep and that I can get pretty far away from the house that I saw on the road that they could not possibly think that I'm trying to break in or anything. Suddenly, I get a great idea. I could go camping up here. It is secluded enough to give the real wood experience, but was close enough to the road that I could not be in any real danger of wildlife or anything. And plus, it's still in the Adirondack Mountains, which is my biggest goal of all. So, sweet, this is what I do. I set up camp in this little clearing that I assessed by climbing the hill, following the power lines, then turn left onto what seemed to be a deer trail. Deer are absolutely everywhere in New York, by the way. When I came upon this nice, flat, grassy clearing, I built my fire off to the side, after making sure to clear the dead wood, etc. I am feeling smart and independent. It was creepy to sleep in the woods alone, as I had always had at least one camping companion, but whatever. The next day, I decided to wander further down the path to see where it leads. I walk for about a half hour, and I can see some fields on the right, but they are in the distance, and there is a fence between the fields and the path. So again, I figure people cannot be mad at me going there. Then, I come across another path, heading to the right. I decide to follow it. A couple of feet in, it curves slightly, and there is an old van on the left of the path. Well, that is strange. It's about 1 p.m., near noon anyway, broad daylight, birds are chirping, so I feel no danger. I go up to the van, which had obviously been there an exceptionally long time. It was 70 styles, made me think of a Scooby-Doo van, and it was way overgrown with weeds. There were streaks of brownish red going down the side from the bottom of the doors. I looked in to see what appears to be an old bed or some sort in the back, but it was all shredded. The curtains in the windows were all shredded as well, and the clothing was strewn about like it was from the 70s or early 80s. I felt no danger signs. Snickering at the terrible fashions back in the day, I continue along the path for a short time until I finish rounding the slight bend. I stopped dead in my tracks. Finally, finally my reptile scent or whatever you want to call it wakes the heck up and starts screaming at me full volume. Up ahead, there is this creepy-ass doll hanging from the trees. It's hanging by its neck, with a rope, not just stuck in the trees. Just to the left of that, there is an old garage, overgrown with weeds. To the right of it, though, there is this huge cage-like structure, easily big enough to hold a full-size man. It seems to be made up of pipes and other long metal objects just kind of welded together in some sort of haphazard way. Some were up, some were down, some were across, and the squares they made up were not big enough to fit my head through. Not that I tried. It had four sides and a ceiling. It had other creepy dolls hanging from it. It also had reddish-brown stains running down the sides, just like the van. Further behind it, there is a run-down house. Creeped out, I just turned and ran as fast as I could. I am not a runner. I am a chunky girl. I had smoked for six years at that point, and I do not run. But I ran that day. I do not even remember the run. I just remember coming upon my campsite, grabbing my tent in one swoop as I ran past. Luckily, I had put my things into the tent, ripping it out of the ground as I continued running. I left my cooler, my food, all that behind, and I never went back for it either. I dropped the tent stake somewhere along the way. I had to repair rips in my tent and buy all new gear. I tore down the hill. I am still surprised it did not break my neck. I jumped in my car and sped home. I locked all my doors, then paced my house going, what the hell, what the hell, what the hell, for hours. It has been 11 years since that incident, 
and even typing it now makes my hand shake. I now live almost 1400 miles away, but I still just made sure my doors were locked, and they are. Crazy thing is, is I'm not even in the deep woods anymore. Maybe in the 70s, uh, people did some crazy stuff out there, I don't know. As it stands now though, there are people living within a short walk of this place, and I don't know how or why nothing has been done about it. I did not call the cops, I cannot really articulate why I didn't. My best analysis, looking back, is that I did not want that creep to come find me. I should have, yes, you are right. I am hoping that it was just an old crime scene, and not some sick freak who keeps people in cages in the woods. Anyways, be careful out there in the Adirondacks, even if you are in a more populated area. I found myself on an expedition deep within the forest. To be more precise, High Peaks Wilderness, which is an area within the Adirondack Mountains. I brought along a friend of mine who you can call Trailmaster, and another friend of mine called Nymph. These trails are endless. It's a beautiful mountain range, filled with mile after mile of dense forest. The true definition of beautiful and dangerous after hiking for most of the day, we must have traveled just under three and a half miles. Trailmaster found a good spot for us to settle down for the night. A slight breeze blew from the northeast as the sun was on the verge of setting. An estimate of two and a half hours of daylight left. Trailmaster set out to gather wood and nymph went to collect water from a nearby creek. I worked on setting up our tent for the night. Suddenly... Nymph came running back to the camp without the canteens, and the sound of her panting followed by her dropping to the dirt to her knees. It left me in awe for a second. Believe me when I say I've known Nymph, and it is unusual for her to be panting that loud and freaked out. Are you okay? I did my best to calm her down while trying to get answers. What's the matter? I asked her, just as Trailmaster returned with a bundle of sticks. What's wrong with her? He asked. That is when Nymph told us the story. She had just arrived at the creek and found a good spot, just as she was filling the canteens. The cliché sound of a twig snapping not far behind her was heard. The sound she believed was originating from the other side of the creek. She brushed it off as an animal probably spooked by her presence and kept filling the canteen. Then she heard it again, except the sound was louder and much closer. What she heard next was an audible grunting sound, the type a male white-tailed deer might give. The feeling of dread washed upon her. She suddenly felt as though she should not be there and that she needed to get out, quickly followed by the sudden feeling of being watched. It made her extremely uncomfortable, almost to the point of being disoriented. She rose to her feet and took a few quick steps back and then she saw across the creek obstructed by trees only a pair of antlers and what looked to be like legs hind legs followed by loud grunting she thought it could have been a deer her better judgment kicked in and she thought to herself what deer is not afraid of being so close to a human she ran back to the camp when the grunts became louder and started to sound almost threatening are you sure trailmaster asked with a hint of uncertainty in his voice. Nymph did not even answer him, instead shot him a cold stare. It was most likely a deer. Are you afraid of a deer? Said Trailmaster. I, on the other hand, will give Nymph the benefit of the doubt. Nymph, even in her current state, could describe what she saw, heard, and felt. It was her senses and a gut feeling that made her run away. Trailmaster opted to go look at the area where Nymph had previously been. Nymph was reluctant. She would not go back, so Trailmaster set out alone. Nymph stayed at camp with me, who was debating on whether we needed to relocate our camp. I needed a report before the decision could be made, though. When Trailmaster arrived in the area of the creek where Nymph had been, this is what he observed. Footprints, which were most likely Nymphs, headed in the direction of our camp, and empty canteens on the ground. On the other side of the creek, there were prints resembling an animal, perhaps a deer. 
The only problem was the spacing of the prints and how something about them appeared to be missing. A deer typically walks in all fours. Upon closer inspection, Trailmaster came up with the conclusion that this deer had been walking on its hind legs. The prints formed a trail. The trail seems to have emerged from somewhere in the woods and continues for a few meters and stops at the opposite edge of the creek. They then turn around and head back in the direction they originated from without overlapping on the original set. Trailmaster later admitted it did spook him a bit and he too felt uneasy. He arrived back at camp a half an hour later with our filled canteens. Even if we wanted to move, it would be nearly impossible as the sun had already began to set. Fast forward two and a half hours. Our tents were pitched, campfire lit, and dinner served. We decided that it was best for one of us to always be awake until first light. It was just too dark to move now. My tent was only a foot away from Nymph's tent. There was a good reason for that. Trailmaster's tent had been closer to ours. The perimeter of our camp was set up with a trap, so that if someone tripped the wire, some tin cans and fishing line, primitive but effective, Nymph did not say much about the incident that night, and I do not blame her. She was still a bit shaken from the incident, though I would keep her safe. Trailmaster's findings at the creek only raised uncertainty. Thinking about what Nymph saw, what Trailmaster found made me uneasy. The darkness around us, followed by the eerie silence of the woods and the uncertainty of what was out there, was unsettling. The sound of burning wood was the only sound loud enough to distract us from the faint sounds in the distance. The mind can play tricks on you at night, and that night, it seemed like a dark figure was always standing a few meters outside of our camp, beyond the reach of our fire's light. Every rustle in the bush was something trying to sneak upon us. Every sound has a source. It is exactly those sounds that makes the night in the woods so magical. Trailmaster and Nymph were asleep. I was on watch. The sound of crickets at night are absolutely nature's lullaby, which was having me on the verge of falling asleep, when suddenly, it stopped. I had fallen asleep while on watch. Nymph said that she had woken up sometime during the early hours of the morning, around 0400. She found both me and Trailmaster out. The air outside of the tent was filled with a putrid smell. She described it as rotting flesh that just seemed to linger. A weak old carcass already in the stages of decomposition. It was that bad, she said. Nymph, alarmed by the smell, woke both of us up. We obviously had not smelled anything hours before. I did a perimeter check and found nothing unusual. We did feel as if we were being watched though, which itself is an overwhelming feeling. The smell faded within the hour after we started to make some noise. It was only during the first light about two hours later we did notice it. Prince, from what I assumed to be a deer, just a few meters away. Trailmaster confirmed that these were the identical prints to what he had seen by the creek yesterday. It could have just been a random deer in the night, Trailmaster said, but I don't know if that's something that we can just let go of. The thing I found strange and unusual was the way these prints just seemed to pace back and forth horizontally and then head back in a vertical direction. Trailmaster said that they seemed to be missing a pair, once again, meaning it was just hind legs. From the looks of it, I must agree because these prints seemed odd. The prints were of a deer for sure, but what bothered us was the zigzagging pattern of the vertical prints, which were strikingly similar to how a human being might walk. Trailmaster was tempted to follow the set of prints which headed in another direction. Nymph was hysterical and had no intention of doing such a thing. She said the whole ordeal just seemed odd and downright creepy. A deer creature, weird prints, and not to mention the stench. Was this creature stalking us? I had no intention of finding out. I urged Trailmaster to forget about it and to just move forward. The third time is the charm. I told Trailmaster, let's not be around for it. We were on the move for most of the day, and Nymph still felt overwhelmed with dread. Trailmaster did not experience the same feelings, hence why he opted to go investigate the prince before. He seemed to be fine. Nymph admitted how she thought the creature was following us. I told her to stay close. I do not think that that was happening. 
but I honestly could not really tell you what actually was happening. Eventually, though, once we got closer and closer to the end of our hike, all the feelings of dread vanished as well as the feeling of being watched. The atmosphere felt lighter as we moved out of the area. Perhaps we were just in its territory, so it felt the need to make its presence known. We no longer felt threatened, nothing else significant happened that is worth mentioning, but I, I do want to reflect on how we got lucky on that trip. Perhaps this creature decided to spare us, maybe it meant no harm, we simply do not know. So many questions with so few answers, I am not 100% sure what it was, I don't know what we encountered, I have no idea what we encountered either, though one name comes to mind when I do research. And that's a Wendigo. I've heard stories about the existence of this creature from folklore. I have managed to remain a skeptic, but what we experienced out there, up in High Peaks Wilderness, is not something we will likely forget. Whatever that creature was, I would like to think that it's still out there, waiting for the next group of hikers who venture off the trail into the vast unknown. Be careful out there. Hey Swamp Dweller, I never thought I'd be telling one of my stories to YouTube. I truly feel that this story, as well as others I'm willing to share, will be right at home here in the swamp. My name is Eric. My most recent unusual encounter happened in the summer of 2020. I took a solo hiking and camping trip with my dog in the California Sierras, about 30 miles southwest of Donner Lake. Nina is a four-year-old, 65-pound German Shepherd pit bull mix with an attitude. I'm a 33-year-old man standing six foot tall and 175 pounds. I am a genuinely nice person most of the time, but I did grow up in a tough environment and therefore take physical fitness and self-defense very seriously. I am also no stranger to the supernatural. I was a follower of scientism until I witnessed something, a story for a different time, when I was 12 years old. Since then, I knew there was more out there. My mother and I live in the same county, so I asked her just to drop me off at the exit of the 80 freeway not too far from Gold Run. I found the path I was going to start out and started hiking. Within 30 minutes of walking, I saw maybe 3 or 5 people, normal family type kind of stuff, you know, nothing crazy. But then, I saw someone that was out of place. To say the least, it was odd. It was a large, shirtless man, wearing shorts, boots, and a gas mask. He was in his mid to late thirties if I had to guess, and had prison tattoos and a shaved head. He was walking normally, and said something to me along the lines of, Nice dog. At least, I think that's what it was. It was really hard to hear him behind a gas mask, as you can imagine. At the time, I only brought my bear spray and my fixed K-bar knife with a 7-inch blade for protection. I did not feel threatened but was watching him closely as well as my dog because she can read situations like a pro and is super protective over me. As we walked past each other, I just nodded and smiled. I do not think this had anything to do with what happened later when it got dark the same night, but it was just such an unusual thing to witness I thought it would be worth mentioning. Another thing about me is that I almost never hike on trails. Sometimes at the beginning of a journey, I will start an actual path, but I pretty much always stray off the path in pursuit of exploring places visited less by humans. I have gotten about 10 ticks on different occasions, and a bunch of other uncomfortable and itchy pests and plants, but I just like to be away from people and do my own thing. I had a rough go on this hike. It was hot and very steep terrain. I pushed myself and my dog a bit too far. After I had been hiking for about four hours, I stopped to set up a shelter for the night because I knew it was going to be getting dark in about two hours. As I was setting up my tarp and paracord shelter, I noticed my dog appeared to not want to move very much, which is very much out of character for her. I figured something was wrong and sure enough, two of her paws got cut up bad. She was bleeding. I think it was from the sharp rocks, but I am not too sure. Either way, I had to figure out what to do. After a few seconds, I knew I should ask my mom to pick us up that night. 
That meant a hike all the way back to where I started. My legs were sore from carrying my backpack weighing about 30 pounds with my tarp and sleeping bag, food, and water, and of course other survival stuff. But I love my dog more than pretty much anything, or anyone, so it had to be done. I knew her feet would be much sore the following morning, and I did not want to do that to her. On the way back, I was pushing her too hard once again. The sun was going down, and I was only about halfway back when my legs began to cramp up periodically. Very bad. Soon, after the cramps were getting to the point where my legs were just giving out, I knew I had to rest them for the night. Now, it is dark. I found a clearing that was not flat, but not terribly steep either. For shelter, I just put my tarp on the ground in between two trees. I was far too fatigued to be picky. Everything in the area was dry, way too dry for a fire even if I had the energy to make one, and there were dead leaves everywhere around me. It was still warm. I am an exceptionally light sleeper as well. Any unusual or out of place sound will have me awake and alert in an instant. On this night, I had trouble getting into a deep sleep, so I was semi-conscious with my dog right up against me. My dog and I were resting peacefully. No wind, no leaves crunching or anything. Suddenly, I'm being ambushed by a predator, something big and fast. It seemed to just appear from nowhere and began running full speed at me from about 12 feet away. Too fast, too aggressive, I could feel its bloodlust for me. I could feel that I was the target. Me and my dog were immediately on guard at the same time. I popped up to a sitting position with my knife in my hand. My dog charged this thing with all her might before her lease reached its limit. It got about five feet away from us and stopped suddenly and just vanished. Again, no leaves crunching or anything. It simply did not make any noise. It does not make any sense how it can move without making any noise. Thankfully, I always keep Nina on her leash looped to my belt when I am sleeping in the wild because I know she will chase animals into the forest, even if I command her not to. This creature was after me in my weakened and apparently vulnerable state. I never could see what it was. It was too dark and it happened so fast. But dogs have good night vision at close distances. I know Nina saw that thing because of the rest of the night, she had her arms on my chest protecting me. With her head on a swivel, at the very slightest noise. I have never seen her so concerned before. Ever. I have no doubt in my mind that this being was some sort of cryptid or powerful supernatural entity. No known animal can appear and disappear suddenly without making a single noise. I have been stalked by mountain lions on three occasions, and even they make a noticeable amount of noise when creeping up in that sort of environment. Thanks for listening. I have more encounters to share, and will send them your way once I get them written down. Until then, evil feeds on fear, so in the face of darkness, you must become the light. Last year, my family went to a family reunion up in Bozeman, Montana. It was winter, and we had gone up to celebrate Thanksgiving. My grandma and grandpa lived in this house that backed up to some woods outside of town. They had a few sheep and had a small pasture where they would let them graze. My grandpa worked outside a lot, and he was an avid backpacker and had a few guns and went hunting every year when the season comes around. Let me assure you this is no creepypasta. I have never been particularly scared of any of those stupid things. I go backpacking in the Sierra Nevada mountains relatively often, and I have climbed a few of the tallest peaks in the range. I have always feared this though. The day before Thanksgiving, my grandpa took my dad and me out to the Crazies, a mountain range about 60 miles outside of Bozeman, dead in the heart of the Sierra Nevadas. This range had always freaked my grandpa out a little as he had found the remains of some guy who had gotten lost out there. He always tells me a spooky Native American story. When we first got there, the snow was fresh, so there was extraordinarily little sound. My dad looked really shaken up and kept saying that we should find another place to go hunt. We walked into the woods and I remember distinctly how loud the crunch of the snow was whenever we walked. A couple of hours later, my grandpa saw some big four-point buck running through the trees about a hundred yards away or so. I was very anxious because my dad was yelling about how I was going to shoot my first buck before he did. My grandpa thought that there was something off about the whole thing, 
as the buck looked very odd to him. Then we started to hear what sounded like voices. They were not exactly voices at first, more like a strange sound trying to impersonate what my dad was saying. It was garbled and almost demonic, but I'm not deeply religious, or have I ever been, and I do not think that demons and all that really exist. They sounded more like the sound of those cheap voice recording apps that you get for free on your phone. My grandpa took his rifle from his shoulder, and so did my dad. I was getting very scared at this moment, and I started to murmur to myself. The garbled mess imitated my nonsense, and it sounded so close. My grandpa yelled that they had rifles and that they were not afraid to use them. I guess he was trying to scare off some prankster kids who he thought was messing with us, but there were only the voices that echoed back. My grandpa fired a shot from his rifle into the woods, and there was no movement or anything, not even a single sound. There was a cracking of twigs behind us very suddenly, and my dad turned his head and screamed, Holy hell, we need to get out of here! We turned and ran away, with my dad half pulling me and half carrying me back the way we came. I was crying, but through my tears I remember seeing what looked like a man running after us. It seemed to be running through the trees, but not through, more like on the trees. I do not really know how to describe it. The man was white, whiter than the snow, but it was skinny tall and had antlers on its head. My grandfather turned around and tried to shoot it, but the bolt in his rifle jammed. We kept running until we got back to my grandpa's truck, and then we drove away back to my grandpa's house. I know the story may not really be that scary, but it has always freaked me out a ton. If anyone knows what we saw out there, please help me. I keep thinking that I hear things when I'm on my way to my house alone, and it's really starting to freak me out. Any help in the comments would be greatly appreciated. I am what you would call an avid hiker. Nature is my second home, and with little to do in the small town that I am from, the best way to have fun is to escape to the nearby Sierra Nevada mountains. I often visit Sequoia National Park and Yosemite, as they are not too far from where I live, but this story takes place in Three Rivers, California. Back in May of 2020, I and my husband were eager to get out of the house and get some fresh air, as the virus had had us going stir-crazy. My mom recommended a loop trail that had many pretty features, twin lakes, wild horses, and plenty of trees. As we walked the main path, my mom's descriptions of where to go started to make less and less sense as there were many smaller trails that seemed to lead to the rivers nearby. In fear of getting lost, we stuck to the biggest path we could, as we could see that best on the Google Maps. Later, we found out that we went in the opposite direction of the loop which explained why we were so lost and encountered so many horses so soon. We also found out that the road we walked was a service road, but still looped back to the beginning of the trail. Let us just say that we did not make it far enough on that path to figure that out on our own. After encountering the many landmarks my mom said we were encountered towards the end of the hike, we continued down the dirt path hoping to get home soon to enjoy our next meal. I believe it lightly sprinkled on us as we made our way back and the atmosphere was full of laughs, giggles, and a few hits off our stizzy. That is until we heard a gut-wrenching sound. We stopped dead in our tracks too scared to move but also in disbelief of what had just happened. To the left of us was the side of a mountain that formed a curved nook, almost as if God himself punched the side of the mountain. Within the nook were darkness and trees, though the kind of darkness that is too hard to accurately describe. If I did not know any better, I would think that it could have led to a cave. The bone-chilling sound that made us stop and glance over to see the terrified expression on our faces was comparable to an animal giving us a loud warning to stay back. Even the birds in the nearby trees did not want to take a chance. As after the warning, the birds scattered in every which direction. It was not a growl, not a snarl, or a neigh. It was a strong vibration from one's throat with the mouth closed, 
unlike any animal I have ever heard in my entire lifetime. Still to this very day, we have no clue what it was, as no animal noise we have researched was spot on to what we heard. Still frozen in our tracks and eyes locked on one another, we stood too afraid to move, too afraid to speak. Then we heard another blood-curdling moan, this time louder than the first, with even more birds flying everywhere. It told us this was the last warning we would get. Not taking any more chances, we ran back the way we came for a good half mile, too scared to look back to see if this thing was even chasing us. I cannot begin to explain how terrified I was. My spine was tingling with the feeling of something with its eyes locked on you. It's a hard, hard thing to express in words. We saw some people coming towards us and tried to warn them about what we had just experienced. Unfazed and probably too proud, they continued the path, but later on, we saw them coming the same way we did. To this day, we never go towards the service road and have never experienced anything similar. Our best guess was a mountain lion, but no recording satisfied our appetite for the truth. If you are in the Three Rivers area, do not use the service road to loop back on Skyline Drive. And thank you to whatever it was that let us live that day. I recently took up the hobby of traveling and looking for various minerals with my fiance. On a trip we recently took, we ended up in the Sierra Nevada mountains. The spot we wanted to reach is at the end of an 8 mile hike. Some points on this path are so steep that it takes you nearly 30 minutes to make even 20 feet of progress. This background information is important because on this trip my parents decided to come along as a sort of bonding experience. And upon seeing how steep the trail was, they stayed behind at the car and decided to wait for us to get back. I thank God that they waited for us. Anyways, I and my fiancé are about halfway up the mountain in this desert environment, and it started to get dark eerily fast. We are always careful to check the weather, temperatures, sunsets, legal zones, etc., so this struck us as rather odd. We pushed forward though. Eventually, we reached a point in the path that we decided to take a break at, and my fiancé stops talking suddenly mid-sentence. I look up and meet her gaze, and the look in her eyes instantly told me something was not quite right. I looked in the direction she was staring, and there, maybe a hundred yards away in the middle of the mountains, is what looked like an old man. Dressed in what only looked like could be a dark robe or some sort of black raggedy clothing. We could only tell it was an old man based on how this person was standing with a frail frame. Soon after, I realized what I was looking at. I noticed this person was not moving, simply stopped mid-step, walking up the mountain parallel to us. I do not know why, but my stomach dropped so fast that I almost felt lightheaded. I normally deal with weird or intense situations very well, but this guy or thing made my body react weird to its presence. It seemed as if it had noticed us staring at it or something, because I was terrified to see what looked like an old man began to stand up. I, I failed to notice that it was on its knees or hunched over, and on its thin, frail frame, it began to loom, what seemed like over six to seven feet tall. I could tell by the trees it was next to, which we had previously passed, this was no old man. It was so thin yet so eerily tall. A moment later, my shock and awe were interrupted by the sound of a four-wheel vehicle. I turned to see a jeep coming down the mountain slowly towards us with its headlights on, and my unbroken gaze staring at this creature, I failed to see that it had apparently gotten pitch black in what felt like only a matter of moments. The people in the jeep stopped and offered us a ride before I answered, I looked back at the creature only to see it sprinting back down the mountain, into the wilderness at an ungodly and unnatural speed. This was no old man. Skipping ahead, me and my fiancé got in the jeep, and we simply jumped in the bed of the nice couple's open-style jeep and took a ride back down. The man looked back at me and said in a gruff voice, You shouldn't be out here past dark. Weird things happen in the desert when the sun sets. My fiancé looks at me with a worried expression on her face, but I knew the man must have seen the creatures too. So, 
I felt that he was just referring to that thing. Whatever it was, it caused me to lose time, not even noticing the sun setting at such an alarming rate. It almost made me pass out from simply feeling its presence. I do not know what it was. I have heard stories in the area and rumors of dogs going missing, people going missing too. I don't know what I saw, but I do know there is something unnatural in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Hello Swamp Dweller, this story is from my cousin's point of view. I grew up in a family that loves the outdoors. We live in Southern California near the beautiful Sierra Nevada mountains that are almost perfect for hunting. This story happened a few years back. I went on a deer hunting trip with my dad and grandpa and a friend of mine. Our hunting took place near the Cleghorn Trail near a small town called Crestline. Now, there have been conspiracy theories of witchcraft and Satanism going on in this town. I have been hunting near it before, but never experienced anything creepy until this hunting trip. We arrived at our stop down a little way away from this town. We prepared our gear and loaded our rifles. All of us had walkie-talkies just in case we needed to communicate. We hiked all over this mountain with not much being spotted. However, maybe an hour into our hike, I hear the radio crackle to life. It was my dad who was yelling. Hey, there's a white deer running up towards you guys. Keep in mind, I'm pretty sure white deer do not exist, and if they do, they're incredibly rare. So this was a bit unnerving to me. Well, I looked down the hill and sure enough, there is a pale white deer running up the mountain. But just as quick as it appears, it just vanishes, and we never see that white deer ever again. The rest of the day went uneventful after that. A few weeks later, I decided to go up this mountain alone to try to track this deer down. It was early in the morning still. It was pretty dark out. As I approach a patch of dense trees, I notice sticks hanging from the trees, almost like the Blair Witch. There were pentagrams and dolls everywhere. I was honestly a bit freaked out at this point, but I kept going as I really wanted to track this white deer down. I was totally unaware that I was walking into the direction of this town known for witchcraft. Ten minutes into my hike through these trees, I ran into an old, frail-looking lady, giving me the most hateful stare. She was in a black robe. Now the weird thing is, her eyes were two different colors. She screamed, Get out! And don't ever come back! I hightailed it out of there, ran down to my truck and sped out of there like a bat out of hell. These experiences were creepy, but it has not stopped me from loving the outdoors. I just make sure I stay the heck out of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Thanks for sharing my story, and remember, be careful out in the woods. You never know who or what you might run into. My boyfriend and I just bought our first house in June on a lake about an hour northeast of Seattle, Washington. Aside from the lake community we are part of, there really is not a large population around here. We are in between a few larger towns, but they are about a 20 minute drive from where we live. Our house is backed up right against the Cascade Mountains. We are pretty much the last bit of population before the mountain begins. About 30 yards from our driveway is a dead end road that turns off the main lake road and goes back into the woods a few miles. There are a few gated forest service and logging roads that branch off of this road. My boyfriend and I ride our dirt bikes up these roads and they themselves go on for miles. There aren't really many other houses out here, except for a few, and they're all on the main, dead-end road. Before taking the dirt bikes up it, I had walked up this road a few times exploring the area, and it always felt just a little bit odd to me. My boyfriend has said things like, This road is very creepy in broad daylight. It totally could have been that it was just very wooded in most spots and therefore shaded, and the lack of houses made it odd. But I stopped walking up this road for this reason. When we moved in, I was dog-sitting my friend's pit bull, Bella. She was about 70 pounds and was a totally fearless brat. She was kind of aggressive with other dogs, and even with some people, food handling, etc. I would walk her up the dead-end road often while I had her because there were hardly any houses and no traffic. One day, 
We were about two miles up the road and had come down a small hill onto a flat, treeless area where there was an old abandoned barn and a large field that the road cut through. There was tall grass on either side of the road. When we got to the area, Bella's tail went down and she kept her head low. She also started to look around and back behind us, just acting nervous, which was a bit odd for her. As we were coming around a turn, about a hundred yards in front of us was a logging road that went off the road and straight up a hill. It had a large gate at the bottom to keep vehicles out. My boyfriend and I have put our dirt bikes under this gate before and go riding up the trails, so I know how tall it is. The top bar of the gate comes to my chest and I'm about five foot five. What I saw still scares me to think about. Standing right in front of this gate was a huge black dog. It was standing broadside with its head low, and I am almost positive it was looking towards us because I could not make out a snout or ears. I never saw a tail either, but it may have just been lowered between its hind legs. The shoulder of this thing was higher than the top bar of the gate because it was blocking part of its view. I stopped instantly and held Belle's harness as tight as I could so she could not advance forward anymore and catch sight of this thing because you know how aggressive dogs can be. I looked at this thing for no more than two seconds total before turning back and hauling my butt back up the road because I heard this thing growl a hundred yards away from it and I heard the thing growl this awful, almost hissing sound and growl. I was totally terrified, and at this point so was Bella. It was a long two miles back, and I could not stop looking over my shoulder, and Bella was also freaked out the whole time. The growling, the massive black dog, was not the only thing I was terrified of. I also had this awful, awful feeling of fear and dread come over me when I saw it. It was overwhelming, and I have never felt anything like it. Even in typing this and remembering the details is making me feel jumpy. It took me a long, long time to feel okay and safe in our new house, especially at night. Even now, I have a really hard time if I'm home alone. My boyfriend is 100% sure I saw a black bear, but I know I did not see a bear. I grew up in rural Pennsylvania and have seen more black bears than he will probably see in his entire life. This thing had long, skinny legs and a deeply curved rib cage and a belly similar to a Doberman. Wolves do not live in this area, and even if they did, this would have been one abnormally large, skinny wolf. Now, in listening to this show, I have learned about skimwalker encounters. I have pretty much lost my mind when I heard the similarities. I am beginning to become more and more convinced that what I saw was not a normal, natural thing. This happened in a forest near where I live. Over the summer, my friends and I went camping for one night up in the Cascade Mountain Range. There are valleys with old logging roads that people camp at the end of. Well, I have gone here my entire life camping, hiking, and whatnot. I have run into black bears right in front of me and other crazy stuff like that. Anyway, we all unpacked my truck and my friend's SUV. We were going to just have two people sleep in the SUV. I was going to sleep in the cab of my truck and another two friends were going to sleep in their tent they brought. The late afternoon seemed fine and uneventful. There is a pool from a large stream that you can swim in and we jumped in even though it really was not that warm out. After we started a fire, I'm not sure if it was allowed but you know, we did it anyway. We also had a gas stove and I warmed up some soup I brought. Everybody else snacked and did whatever else. We had brought some firewood as we were not trying to steal all the wood from the local area and we just hung out. Around 8.30 p.m., it was still pretty light out, a Toyota Sequoia, it looked in pretty good shape, even if it's a bit old, came down the path, and a middle-aged guy stepped out. He explained that he was looking for a camp area for his wife and kid. Anyway, they turned around and went another way. I will say that was the only person we saw after we turned off of WA-20. It was totally normal until 10 p.m. Around 9.30, I smoked a joint. It was just me. My other friends don't smoke or drink. We were just chilling around the fire talking. Fire had been going for at least four hours by now. We decided we were going to go to bed. I went to pee behind a tree, and I thought I saw somebody move on the hill. It's pretty forested, and it's behind me. So, I thought that I was just high, and maybe I just imagined something. But I did take note and was aware of it. Like I said, I just thought it was me. I'm not really a timid guy, so I brushed it off. I went back and told everybody that I was going to go crash in my truck. Well, sometime around 2.30 a.m., I am woken up by my friend and his girlfriend, the two people sleeping in the tent, banging on my door. I opened the passenger side door and then the back one, and they practically dove in and locked the doors. 
I tried calming them down and asking them to relax and breathe. They said something about somebody whispering to them from outside their tent, saying they were going to murder them, or something like that. I did not really buy their story, but I asked them what they wanted to do. They both wanted to leave pretty badly, but my truck was stuck between my two friends who were in the SUV. They were kind of blocking us from leaving. They convinced me to honk and flash my lights, so I go to turn on my truck and nothing. At the time, I had a problem where the battery connector would slip off the battery making no power go to the truck, so I popped the hood, got out, and slipped it back on. I looked around with my phone flashlight and did not see anything and walked up and banged on my friend's SUV. They both woke up. I explained that they were hearing some weird stuff out here, so they decided that we could leave and come get the stuff tomorrow or whatever. We started driving back down the logging room from where we came. Maybe about a half a mile down the road, there is this Y. You can turn left and go down to one section, or you can go right that goes up the mountain. As we went through the Y, there was a Civic or some other early 2000s sedan just running with its lights up on the other side of the Y. As we drove, it turned on its headlights and began to follow my truck. As I was in the back, when I saw this, I freaked out, but could not really do anything. The car behind us eventually just stopped and we continued to the main road and began going back down into civilization. We got back to my friend's house at about 4 or 4.30. I don't know what that car was doing waiting there, and I don't know if they were waiting for us or just wanted to freak us out. I honestly don't know. We went back the next day with my best friend's dad, and we picked up the tent and all the other things we left. It was all there and nothing was moved or anything. I will say that you could see where the white car accelerated out of the Y behind us. The odd thing was is near our campsite was a bunch of leaves and ferns, and they were put on the ground in such a way that it was meant to hide something or maybe someone. Anyways, this is the only creepy thing that's ever really happened to me out here in the Cascade Mountains. Also, before anyone asks, no, I did not call the cops, and nobody gets reception until you get off the mountain anyway, so it didn't really matter. Some background to the story. My family and I were planning a camping trip in the Cascade Mountains in Washington State for a week back in 2013. We did not go to a campground. Instead, we opted to just hike a few miles in and find a good spot near the river. The first few days were normal enough, but on the fifth day, I left the campground to go collect some firewood. I went a little further than I was supposed to, so I was running the risk of getting lost and I knew this. On my way back to the campground, I noticed a very weird deer or moose type creature stalking me. The reason I thought it might have been a moose is that its head had to be at least 7 feet off the ground. Its head was around the lower branches of the pine tree it was behind. I was starting to get a little freaked out because I had not seen a single deer or moose the whole time we were there. I started to walk a little bit faster back to where the campsite was, which had to be at least 2 miles away. I started to run, and as I was running, just trying to get back to the campsite, I heard these very loud footsteps about 40 feet behind me. As I turned around to see what it was, I saw the thing but it was no deer and it was no moose. It had a head like a deer, but it was way too messed up to be any real deer. It had blood in its teeth and a weird man-like body, but it was so skinny you could see its ribcage. It also had hind legs like a dog, but uh, I guess that's the best way I can describe it, I don't know. As soon as I saw that thing, I ran as fast as my legs would let me. This thing was gaining on me and it was gaining fast. I knew it was going to catch me. I had to hide, so I found a log to hide behind to catch my breath. Once I caught my breath, I started running again. But this time, it was right behind me. I could feel its hot breath on my neck. I was getting close to the campsite when this thing tried to grab me. It missed, but left a deep scratch mark on my back. It stopped about a half a mile away from the campsite. I did not stop running though. I kept going until I got to the campsite. I told my mom and dad what happened, but they did not believe me. That night, I didn't get a wink of sleep. The next day we finally left, and I never want to camp in the Cascade Mountains ever again. Hey Swamp Folk. IP Vanish has sponsored this video. IP Vanish is a virtual private network, a VPN for short, 
A VPN is a super important tool that helps you safely browse the internet. You can use a VPN on your computer, tablet, phone, even things like your Fire Stick when you're streaming media. When you use a VPN, all your data is encrypted. What you're doing, what you're reading, what you're searching, even what you're watching. Whatever it is you're doing. That's pretty important because what you're doing on the internet is no one else's business but yourself. IP Vanish helps you remain anonymous and secure on the internet. For listeners of the show, IP Vanish is offering an incredible 65% off. That's just $349 for the first month or $3149 for the year. IP Vanish comes with a ton of cool stuff. You get an anonymous IP address. This means your personal IP address can't be tracked by anyone on the web. You can circumvent any online censorship. IP Vanish has more than 1,500 servers in 70 plus locations. You can get protection when using public Wi Fi. Remember, with IP Vanish, all your data is encrypted, so no one can snoop on what you're doing. You get 24 7 support. You can email them, chat with them, and even call them. They're there to help. So go to ipvanish.com slash swamped. Claim your 65% savings. This is the time to sign up. With our discount and their current promotional offerings, you can get a VPN for 65% off their usual offering. IP Vanish is the best of the best, even rated 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot. And that's with more than 6,000 reviews. Show these guys some love. They're repeat sponsors and help the show out a lot. Remember, it's ipvanish.com slash swamped to get the deal and start protecting yourself online. That's a 65% saving. Now... Let's get into these stories. I have always loved the outdoors. I was fortunate enough to be born in the great Pacific Northwest, the Western Washington Cascades to be exact. My father and I spent much of my early years exploring the mountains, fishing, and hunting. There are parts of the Cascades I know like the back of my hand. One of those places is called Goblin Creek up the Index Galima Road off Highway 2. When I was a kid, we would drive up there to do some fishing and shooting, but also to collect a specific type of rock that when cut in half and polished would resemble a scenic picture of the view of mountains from within a cave. I do not recall the true name of these stones. We just called them picture rocks. My father's friend and neighbor owned an art gallery slash mineral shop that used to be a church. If you have ever driven through Startup on your way from Sultan to Gold Bar on Highway 2, you might remember seeing the robot sculpture outside the shop that my dad built. This is the place that we sold the stone for $2 a pound. The walk from the creek where we harvested these rocks to the dirt road was not particularly long, but long enough that you could presumably get lost while en route if one did not know where to go. In the years we spent at this creek, I had only ever seen two people out there. One was a game warden that heard gunshots from our target practicing session and tracked us down to make sure everything was fine. The other is the subject of my curiosity. When I was about 14 years old, I distinctly remember hauling a backpack full of these rocks up the creek to my dad's truck. Along the way, I ran into a man that looked to be about 30 years old if I had to guess. We both appeared to be surprised that we would run into anyone in this rather remote section of the mountains. But as I got closer to this man... He was heading down to the creek, I was heading up to the road. He seemed to grow increasingly more startled as if he were seeing a ghost. He did not say anything as I passed. He just stared at me seemingly trying to figure out the appropriate words to ask. After passing him, I remember thinking how much this guy looked like he could be in my family. The similarities were oddly striking. I continued to the truck, dumped my load of rock off at the truck and headed back down to the river to my dad. When I arrived, I told him about the encounter and asked him if he had seen this man, to which he replied he had not. I remembered this encounter quite vividly since then. Last year, I was visiting my family in Snohomish and decided to head up to Goblin Creek for nostalgic purposes. It had been about 15 years since I was last up there. Along the way there, I found out that the Index Galima Road had apparently washed out years before. Luckily though, I knew another way there via Jack Pass. I found the dirt road and parked where my dad used to park and proceeded to walk through the woods down to the creek. Along the way, I saw something that absolutely shook me to the core. As I was about halfway through the woods, I was startled to see someone else coming up from the creek. A boy, about 14 years old. He was wearing a backpack that looked to be burdened by heavy weights. As we got closer, 
I began to get increasingly more confused and shocked as the boy looked exactly like I did at his age. I meant to say something to him as he passed but could not figure out the right words to express what I was thinking. He passed me and kept going. I walked a little way and finally stopped when it really hit me. I remembered the encounter from my teenage years and realized I had just lived the other half of the experience. Both the man and the boy were me, roughly 15 years removed. I turned around to catch up to the boy in the thick western Washington woods. I ran all the way back up to the road where my truck was to find nothing. There was no one else there besides the road for him to go to, and I had not stalled so long as to not be able to catch up to him. He was simply gone. Curiosity ended up getting the best of me, so I hurried down the creek half expecting to find my dad fishing on the bank, 15 years younger, but I found nobody. I ended up going home and decided that this experience was too unbelievable to tell even my friends and family. I just wanted to get this out there. I love your show, and I hope people enjoy this one. Thank you for sharing my story. So this story is not one of the ones that involve a near-death experience, but to this day, I still cannot explain what I saw. For context, I'm a 6 foot tall, 150 pound male in my early 20s who is an avid outdoor enthusiast. I have been hiking and backpacking for well over a decade, and I enjoy rock climbing and mountaineering. I spent about 7 years in search and rescue, and have some stories from my experience but nothing creepy or unexplainable from my time there. Anyways, I have spent a fair amount of time outdoors, and over the past year had taken up solo hiking and backpacking. Normally I would try to go with some friends, but I honestly enjoyed the solitude and self-reliance that I often neglected even asking my friends to go, unless I absolutely needed more people. On a rainy November day, I decided to go hiking up to Green Mountain Lookout in the Cascade Mountain Range of Washington State. I intended on spending the night there in the old fire lookout. I checked the map, and the trailhead is rather remote by Washington standards, and it involved something like 26 miles of driving on a partially paved old forest service road. I drive up the road and I'm surprised to see just one other vehicle there. To call it a parking lot would be an overstatement. It was just a wide spot on the road that could fit maybe six vehicles in total. The road meandered past the parking area around a curve and out of sight. While it was a weekend, the weather was rather foul, and above 5,000 feet, the rain would be turning to snow, so I was not expecting to see other people. I park and open my door and start getting my pack ready. There is a light drizzle already and I notice how quiet the woods are. Normally, there is a fair amount of ambient noise if you listen to it in any forest. The only noise I could hear was the water dripping off the leaves and trees. I chalked it up to being late fall and most of the birds had migrated to warmer climates. The bugs were probably hiding due to the rain and it was daytime and the other animals would be seeking shelter from the elements and sleeping from a night of foraging. I start hiking and I'm enjoying the gradual uphill climb of the trail. Now, because of my time in search and rescue, I enjoy tracking. Anytime I'm on a trail, I usually face the ground and like to track other hikers, animals, and keep my skills sharp. I notice that there are two sets of trails of running shoes, one larger and one smaller. After the first mile or so, the trail leaves the confines of the dug fir and western henlock forest to open up to these lush green alpine meadows. In the summer, the alpine meadows bloom and you can see verdant green Indian hellebore, yellow asters, red columbines, white glacier lilies, bright blue lupin, and orange Indian paintbrush. In the late fall though, these meadows are just green with the dying brown stalks of these once beautiful plants. Right at the interface of the alpine meadows to the forest, I meet the two other hikers, a man and a woman coming down. As is customary for hiking on the west coast, you swap trail condition information. I give the hikers a once over and notice they both have trail runners on. They tell me it gets snowy up past the first section of Alpine Meadows and that it started snowing around 3 a.m., but that they had had the trail to themselves today. No bear sightings, which was pretty nice and made sense because there are no mountain blueberries in November. We wish each other well and I continue walking. 
The trail opens to a beautiful valley, flanked by alpine meadows, forest, slide adler, and other mountains. When the view is clear, you can see the north face of the glacier peak to the south. The trail switchbacks up the alpine meadows and through a few patches of trees. I hike up another mile and a half or so before I reach the snow level. It is the first snow of the season, and the snow level was about 5,000 feet, just as predicted. I continue hiking a bit before I notice more tracks in the fresh snow. There are two sets. One set is the track of an exceptionally large dog, like maybe a Mastiff or a Bernese Mountain Dog, given the size, and the second set is a pair of Morel hiking boots. I think if I had to guess they were around size 15 or larger. Normally I would not care about these tracks, but some things did not add up. First, there was only one other vehicle in the parking lot. Second, I had not noticed these tracks before in the mud, and surely I would have noticed them and there's no way I could have confused them with the other hikers' tracks. Thirdly, why did these prints just pop up in the snow halfway up the trail? I know that there are no trails on the backside of Green Mountain that intersect with the trail that I'm on, as it is a rather remote one. It could be a hunter, but that would be unlikely given the difficult access to this point in the trail, and the fact that the two hikers I encountered said that they were alone. All this is giving me a weird feeling. At this point, I'm reminded that the forest is still eerily quiet. There are strange tracks that should not be here. It is snowing, wet, cold, and I could not actually stay overnight in the old lookout because it is locked. The aura of the area just feels ominous. I listen to my gut instinct and decide to go back to my car. So I turn back. I hike down about one mile, and I am on the last of the switchbacks before the trail re-enters the forest when something catches my eye and I stop. I'm looking down an alpine meadow enjoying my view when I spot something about a thousand vertical feet away from me, less than a kilometer away from my location. I squint and see a pure white shape in the meadow. As I'm looking at this white shape, my mind is trying to fathom what the shape could be. My initial thought is that it was one of those 2010 Winter Olympics Inukshuk statues which resembles a man. All I could see is the head and shoulders part, as the rest would be obscured by the underbrush of the alpine meadow. This thing was standing on a 40 degree slope. The more I stare at this thing, the more confused I become. I rationalize that it cannot be snow on a tree or something like that, because that was the first snow of the season and that was only 2,000 vertical feet, and the snow was all the way up at 5,000 feet. I guess it could be a sun bleached and thus white tree stump, but this is unlikely as the area has not been logged before, and this spot was in an alpine meadow, not the forest. It really stuck out to me, given the size of this thing at that distance. It would have to be an ancient stump to be that large. My guess is that it would have had to been about 10 feet tall to be that large from this distance. I shuffle in my pocket to put on my gloves, and when I look back, it appears that this thing has moved ever so slightly. On the head, I can make out two black spots where I should be and a black slit where a mouth would probably be. I freak out because in a minute, I was watching this thing, it had not moved, and the five seconds I look away, it seems to look forward at me. I feel chills run down my shoulders and back. What the hell is this thing? It is a half mile away from me at this point. I am still well over a mile from my car. It feels like I am now being watched intensely, and I feel an uneasy sense of dread building in my stomach. Now, as there are black bears in the Cascades, I always carry bear spray with me. My only other weapon is my pocket knife, which is deep in my backpack. I unholster the bear spray and slowly make my way down the trail. At this point, I am really wishing that I had brought my 357 Magnum, but it weighs 6 pounds and I just cannot justify bringing that sometimes. At this point, I feel like a fool for neglecting that crucial essential. Before I reach the forest, I keep my body facing the area this thing is in. Once I reach the forest, I am reminded just how silent it is. The forest started out quiet. Now it was silent. No wind and just the occasional drip of rainwater. It feels like there is an apex predator in the forest, and it is not me. I still feel watched. At this point, my nerves are starting to get the better of me, and I pick up my pace and jog downhill to the car. I was cognizant that you should never run from a predator, 
as it will trigger its instinct to run down prey. I felt like prey, and I did not like it, but I rationalized that I maybe had a 10 minute lead on this thing, assuming it moves as fast as a person. I start running as silently as I can down the trail, constantly looking over my shoulder while trying to keep my eyes on the ground to not trip over the wet roots. I never heard any sounds of pursuit from this thing, but I was scared and in full fight or flight mode. I was flying out of this place as fast as I could. After a long 15 minutes, I finally reach my car, and it is the only one in the parking area. I throw my backpack into my Subaru and jump into the driver's seat and peel out. I have been stalked by mountain lions, hiked through bear country, and been shot around by hunters on one occasion. But none of my previous experiences can compare to the soul-crushing dread I was feeling once that thing turned to look at me. I went hiking back up to Green Mountain Lookout the following summer. I went to the same spot that I saw that thing and while the underbrush of the pine meadow was higher, there was absolutely no white shape in that area. While I could have just brushed off the feeling of dread as my own paranoia at the quiet forest and weird dog and human prints in the snow, I cannot rationalize how that white shape was there one day and gone eight months later. That one small disparity is what gives me chills to this day. When I was a kid growing up in North Carolina, I was a member of the Boy Scouts of America. I know it might seem corny as hell, but my time in the Boy Scouts honestly made for some of the fondest memories of my childhood, and as much as my friends these days like to make jokes about the deviant proclivities of my former Scoutmasters, nothing remotely weird or unsavory ever happened to me with any of them. There was a lot of fishing, camping, field craft, and community service, just some good old-fashioned wholesomeness that gave my parents a break from me from time to time. Well, all except for this one time. So, one summer, my scout troop goes on this big camping trip up into the Smokies. For those unfamiliar with them, the Smokies, or the Great Smoky Mountains, are a part of the Greater Appalachians and are also home of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. One of the most highly visited national parks in the entire country the name Smokies comes from the natural fog that often hangs over the mountaintops, appearing as large smoke plumes from a distance, and originate from organic compounds that are exhaled by the local vegetation. But excuse the high school science lesson, I'll get on with it. So, we are up in the Smokies, having a good time, when one night, while sitting around the campfire after dinner, one of our scoutmasters decides to tell us a creepy campfire tale. He starts telling us the story of Atlanta, which is the Cherokee name meaning Spear Finger, or one with the pointed spear. Spear Finger supposedly lived in the western part of North Carolina, right up in the Smoky Mountains where we were camped at at the time, and her name referred to her long, slender sharp finger on her right hand, which she used to slice up her child victims, whose livers she ate raw. As legend has it, she apparently clutched the stony skin on her right hand tightly, because her heart was hidden in her palm there. Our scoutmaster goes on to tell us how, because Spearfinger's skin was made of stone, she was invulnerable to arrows of the Cherokee, and her footsteps sounded like thunder as she walked along the mountainside. Whenever her deep voice rumbled around the hillsides, it would scare all the birds away, a warning sign to those she was hunting as she sang her favorite song. I believe the translation would be, Liver, I eat it. Spearfinger was also said to be able to take on the appearance of her child's victim's family members, often taking the form of a kindly old woman to trick her victims into feeling safe around her. She would then lull the child to sleep, running her fingers through their hair to calm them before stabbing her pointed finger through the back of their neck, or through the heart. She would then tear out the livers of her victims before feasting on them, leaving her mouth ringed with fresh blood. By the time our scoutmaster had finished telling us the story, we are all completely and utterly terrified, and only managed to stop freaking out once he had gotten out his old guitar and sang us a few songs. But that night, 
while back in my tent with a buddy of mine, I found myself totally unable to sleep. I kept imagining that, if I did, Spearfinger would come and rip open the tent and stab me in the heart with her long, sharp stony finger, all before tearing out my liver and eating it. Then, right as I was about to drift off to sleep, a bright light lit up one side of our tent. I was completely frozen in fear for a moment, whispering to my buddy to wake up, but I was totally unable to rouse him. I carried on staring at the side of the tent, wondering where the hell the bright light was coming from, as it seemed way too intense to be coming from somebody's flashlight. And then, I just let out a whimper of fear when I heard a hissing sound. I saw a shadow passing over the fabric of our tent. I called out to them, asking who, who was there, but no one said a freaking thing. There was just another faint hissing sound as the figure seemed to creep closer and closer to our tent. Then, I saw the figure raise a hand, and I almost choked in terror when I saw a single, long pointed finger, and a hissing voice whispering something that I can only guess was in Cherokee. I screamed, ripping my way through the front flap of my tent and running around the campsite screaming, It's Spearfinger! It's Spearfinger! She's coming to eat my liver! I expected the rest of the camp to start screaming too, to burst out of their tent in terror, or to maybe just stay inside them in hopes that Spearfinger might pass them over. And do not get me wrong, there were a couple of cries of fear that accompanied my own, but the sound that made me slow to a stop and my peers around in confusion was the sound of laughter. When I looked, I saw another one of the scouts, this kid named Devin. He was just about bent double in hysterics, with a long slender twig tied to one finger. I must have been boiling with rage at the time, but Devin just thought that was extra funny, waving the long wooden twig at me and making that same hissing sound again before bursting into laughter. I swear that was probably the most scared and embarrassed I had ever been during my entire childhood, and all because that little D-bag Devin decided to pull a prank on me. Ever since then, I have been unable to hear the words Smoky Mountains without remembering that Boy Scout camping trip, even if it does make me kinda smile these days. But what does not make me smile is seeing liver in the deli section of a grocery store, because all I think about is the idea of Spearfinger hushing a child to sleep stroking their hair, singing them a little lullaby with the voice of their grandma or favorite aunt, all before ripping out their liver and feasting on it with her stony, skinned lips ringed with dark, fresh blood. I live somewhere around Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Now, I'm not going to give the exact location for privacy reasons. I love the outdoors and I always have. So naturally, I visited the Great Smoky Mountains National Park almost twice a month. I have seen many things, but by far the most horrifying thing that has ever happened to me was seeing a Ravenmocker. For those of you who do not know what a Ravenmocker is, it is a monster from Native American folklore the Cherokee in specific, that eats the hearts of dying people. Anyways, I was walking on the trails with some friends of mine, Aaron and Derek. By the way, my name is John. So we were about a mile into the trail when we all heard the most horrifying screech that we have ever heard. It sounded like a cross between a raven and a person screaming in distress. What happens next was one of the few things that I can vividly recall. After the screech, we heard a very loud flapping noise coming from above the treetops. It was like what you would imagine a pterodactyl flying would sound like. You could tell it was big. We then saw the shape of what somewhat resembled a man, pterodactyl, and raven swooping above our heads. The best way I could describe it was leathery, with feathers. It was an abomination. It let out another screech as it looked back at us, and that is when I saw its eyes. They burned like the sun, and they were red and horrible. It was like a demonic red. We all looked at each other, and Aaron asked, Was that a- No, Derek said quickly. 
If you say its name, it will kill you too, you idiot. At the time, I did not know what a raven mocker was. However, Aaron and Derek both knew what it was, both being part Cherokee. And that is probably why they never told me what it was. We booked it the hell out of there as fast as we could. I swear we ran at light speed back to my pickup truck and drove even faster out of the park. After the whole ordeal, I looked up what raven mockers were and learned that I had probably killed it because it is said that they die soon after a mortal sees them. All in all, it was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. Thanks for sharing my story, and remember that we do not know everything about this world, so always be wary. My father, mother, and I would make frequent trips to the Smoky Mountains and stay in the cabins they have near Pigeon Forge. However, this trip still haunts me to this day. About eight years ago, we stayed in this cabin that had an alarm system. It was already dark outside when we reached the cabin and got settled in. We set the alarm and thought we should watch a movie together. While we were watching the movie, the security alarm went off. The alarm only was to go off if the door was opened. We checked the cabin, top to bottom, and find nothing out of the ordinary. The next morning, we called the company that rented the cabin to us to have them check out the alarm system. Someone came and checked out the system and said that he has been called out to this cabin multiple times within the past month with the same problem. Since it is only the first day at the cabin, I am already feeling just a bit creeped out. I noticed that there is a book on the table that guests can sign and talk about how much they love the cabin. As I was reading more and more stories, I noticed that many of them mentioned feeling unsafe and some even mentioned that they found wet footprints on the deck where the hot tub is. I told my family about these stories and they told me they are just trying to tell scary stories to get other guests spooked. I agree with her and go out about our day. That same night though, we go to bed like normal. My father slept in the basement of the cabin. I slept on the main floor beside the kitchen, and my mother slept on the top floor. My dad snores so loud that we all sleep far away from each other, including my mom. It was about 2am in the morning when I am woken up by the fridge door closing. I looked at the bright light coming from the fridge that was pouring into my room from the crack underneath my closed bedroom door. I noticed that the light would come and go as the fridge door seemed to continue to open and close. I assumed it was one of my parents leaning on the fridge door trying to decide what they wanted to eat for a late night snack. However, I felt weird and did not even consider getting out of bed to join them. The fridge light disappeared slowly and I heard footsteps walk away from my bedroom and head in the direction of the steps to go up to my mom's room. The footsteps seemed to stop for a second and then start to trip up the stairs if that makes sense. Suddenly, they stopped. I assumed that it was my mother and she made it to her room, so I fell back asleep. The next morning I wake up and go directly to my mom and ask what she decided to eat last night. She looked at me and asked, what? I told her that I thought she was at the fridge last night opening and closing the fridge because I heard her go back upstairs after a while around 2am. She looked at me and said, I thought that was you. At this time in my life I was known to sleepwalk every now and then. I saw you standing at the top of the stairs last night around that time. I assumed you were just sleepwalking because you looked at me and went back downstairs. So at this point, I start to freak out and become sick to my stomach. For the rest of the trip, I slept with my mother on the top floor. I did not experience anything else the rest of the trip and never went anywhere alone. A couple of months go by after our trip when my dad tells me he was looking to rent another cabin for a trip. We went to go look at the cabin that we rented last time and found out the cabin had been closed and is no longer available. Out of curiosity, he did some research to find out that many guests experienced something in that cabin. The complaints ranged from feeling unsafe to people thinking someone was in their cabin that should not have been, the people leaving before their vacation was over. I'm not sure what my mother and I had experienced that night at the cabin, but I now know we are not the only ones that went through that. I live in the Smoky Mountains in Northeast Tennessee. I personally believe that these mountains are some of the most beautiful mountains in the world, especially in autumn. 
Anyways, even with all their beauty, they come with many dangerous and unexplainable happenings. Whether that be bears, panthers, crazy hillbillies, or creatures that are unknown. This story that I'm about to tell you happened to my grandfather. I was born late in life and never got to meet him, but he was a very educated and faith-filled man. He walked to school every day in the freezing cold, snow, and rain. He read his Bible front to back numerous times until the pages were barely hanging onto the spine. I have no reason not to believe what he saw was real that night. What scares me the most about this story is that it happened on the very same road which I live. Let me give you a picture of what it looks like. I live in a hollow, which if you do not know is usually a dead end road that has very few houses on it that are not necessarily close to each other. There are rarely any street lights in hollows, and now there were none in mine. My grandfather frequently loved to walk the dark road at night when he would visit his family and lived about a quarter of a mile up the road. The road is surrounded by dense forest on each side, so there is little to no light coming from the moon. I personally would never walk alone in the dark up that road, even if someone paid me. Anyway, one night my grandfather decided to go home after spending a whole afternoon with his family. It was already pitch black outside, but that did not bother him in the slightest. He had done it many times before and he felt perfectly safe walking these familiar roads. He knew everyone who lived on them and he had no reason to be afraid. It was winter, so he did not have to worry about coming across a bear and her cubs which made it even less intimidating than it was for him normally. He said his goodbyes and started down the shadowy road. Everything seemed normal, yet it was much quieter this night. He did not pay that much attention to it though because when snow is coming, it gets eerily quiet in the mountains. He kept walking, his hands in his coat pockets and his eyes glued at his feet. Even though it was close to almost completely black outside, he could still see just a few yards ahead of him. He looked up from his feet to glance at the road before him, and that is when he saw it. He saw a figure. The figure was inhumanly large. It was stocky and seemed to walk with a hunch. It had the shape of a human, but he could not make out any clothes or other features. It was just completely dark. He squinted his eyes and blinked a couple of times, and it was still there. It was walking in front of him at a brisk pace. It did not make a sound when it walked, and this sent chills up his spine. He decided to stop and let it walk on down the road until it was out of sight, but when he stopped, it stopped. He felt his heart begin to pound and fear rushed through him. What was this? Why didn't he see it walking when he left his family's house? How long had it been in front of him? After standing and waiting to see if this figure would move, my grandfather decided to slowly walk to see if it would move on. And sure enough, it did. It moved slowly and carefully, just as my grandfather was. Terror filled his body as he slowly trekked down the road. He was roughly about 200 feet from his house, which was a relief but also terrified him because of the thought of it following him in. He stopped again to see if maybe this thing would just keep going this time. It stopped again. How did this thing know that he was stopping? Why did it stop with him? My grandfather decided to walk faster. Maybe if he could run, it would get spooked and run off. He gathered up his courage and began to walk at a brisk pace. The figure seemed to glide effortlessly at an even faster speed. This scared my grandfather so much that he slowed down to a walk. What would normally take about 30 seconds to walk took 5 minutes. The figure walked as slow as my grandfather did this entire time. Just as my grandfather got to his house, his eyes were still locked on the figure. It, it, it turned. It turned and glided up a small bridge across the road towards one of his neighbor's house. My grandfather ran into his house and locked the door, simply happy to be safe and sound. Maybe this would be the last time he would ever have to see that thing. Maybe he did not even see it. Maybe he was only tired from working in the tobacco patch all day. He shook his head and went to sleep, exhausted from the fear. The next day he headed down to the small gas station about a half mile down the road. His friends and he always met up there to talk golf and goof around. That morning, when he walked in, 
His friends were unusually quiet and had concerned looks on their faces. What's wrong? He asked them. One of them looked up at him, his face pale and eyes red. John passed away last night. He had a heart attack in his sleep. My grandfather felt a pit grow in his stomach. He remembered the figure he had seen the night before. It walked straight across the bridge and right up to his neighbor John's house. My grandfather always said he believed it was death that he saw in front of him that night. He never understood why he saw it and why it seemed to follow him, but he never spoke to anyone except to my father, and my father told me. I believe he saw death that night, and I'm only glad it didn't choose him to be its victim that dark, cold night. I used to lead an outdoors club, and one of the trips I would always take people on was the Smoky Mountains in mid-October. The Smokies are beautiful, and we would do a four-night backpacking loop using the country, three-walled shelters along the Appalachian Trail. The weather was perfect. Fall colors, cool nights, and the classic fog that gives the Smokies their name. It was our last night on the trail, and we were staying on top of Mount Lacante, one of the tallest mountains in the Smokies. I had reserved all the spots in the shelter, about 12, and there were no other campsites on top of the mountain, so I knew we would be relatively alone. Here's some background. Bear with me. The top of Mount Lacante has a western lookout point, an eastern lookout point, and a half-mile trail called the Boulevard that connects the overlooks that runs to the ridgeline of the mountain. The trail is covered by scraggly evergreens that cling to the top of the mountain and there are thousand foot drops along the trailing edge. The shelter is about midpoint on that trail. All my friends and I decide that we would sleep under the stars next to the shelter because the Milky Way was incredible. Then at 5 a.m., we were all going to walk with our sleeping bags to the eastern lookout point to see the sunrise. We stayed up late, and my friend and I decided that he and I would just go to the eastern lookout at 3 a.m. and chat until the sun began to rise. It was a chilly night, about 27 degrees, and fog had just rolled in. It pushed through the dense evergreens and limited our visibility to the bright white cones from our headlamps. My friend and I grabbed our bear spray and sleeping bags and started walking eastward on the boulevard. Once we started moving, I realized how bad the visibility was. The trail snaked through the foggy trees and you could never see what was around the next bend. There were reports of bears in the area so I kept my bear spray out and made as much noise as I could. The fog rolled through the trees like a haunted house. As I turned to bend, I nearly run into a man. He is standing alone in the middle of the trail facing me, not moving, with no flashlight, at 3 a.m. in the wilderness, just standing in the pitch dark. I also realize he is wearing a t-shirt and only has a small book bag. Keep in mind, it is about freezing outside. With bear spray leveled, uh, I stammer, H hello No response. I asked him where he is coming from and where he is going. I don't know. His facial expressions look lifeless. I ask him where he is planning on sleeping tonight, given that he has no gear. I don't know. With you? Hell no. I could put it together quick. This guy was on a lot of drugs. He eventually admitted that he had walked from a town that is about 30 miles away, but he kept on saying he wanted to stay with us at the shelter. Then, he would speak nonsense. Suddenly, he said, I'm being followed by a dog. I figured he was just seeing things, so I asked what it looks like. It's big and black and it has an orange collar. Oh no. I realized that it is probably one of the tagged bears in the park. This sketchy guy is being stalked by a bear and leading it towards my friends who are sleeping in a shelter. I tell him I know of a spot he could stay, a luxury cabin compound about 15 minutes down the mountain where they can call the MPS. I tell him to walk in front of me, and I start directing him where to turn. I figured if he tried something erratic, I could blind him with my light and follow up with the bear spray. I eventually get him down to this cabin and wake the employees to let them know he needs help. They tell me I can leave, so I head back to my friends and tell them what is going on. Before I go to sleep, I jog back down to the rangers to make sure everything is fine. They say, we don't know where he went, he stepped out the door, and now we can't find him. 